That's just how white folks will do you, one of my African-American friends might say when we were alone. Everybody would chuckle and shake their heads, and my mind would run down a ledger of slights. The first boy in seventh grade who called me a coon, his tears of surprise, why'd you do that, when I gave him a bloody nose? The tennis pro who told me during a tournament that I shouldn't touch the schedule of matches pinned to the bulletin board because my color might rub off. His thin-lipped, red-faced smile, can't you take a joke, when I threatened to report him. The older woman in my grandparents' apartment building who became agitated when I got on the elevator behind her and ran out to tell the manager that I was following her. Her refusal to apologize when she was told that I lived in the building. Our assistant basketball coach, a young, wiry man from New York with a nice jumper, who after a pickup game with some talkative black men, had muttered within earshot of me and three of my teammates that we shouldn't have lost to a bunch of niggers, and who, when I told him, with a fury that surprised even me, to shut up, had calmly explained the apparently obvious fact that there are black people and there are niggers. These guys were niggers. That's just how white folks will do you. It wasn't merely the cruelty involved. I was learning that black people could be mean and then some. It was a particular brand of arrogance, an obtuseness in otherwise sane people that brought forth our bitter laughter. It was as if whites didn't know they were being cruel in the first place, or at least thought you deserving of their scorn. White folks. The term itself was uncomfortable in my mouth at first. I felt like a non-native speaker tripping over a difficult phrase. Sometimes I would find myself talking to Ray about white folks this or white folks that, and I would suddenly remember my mother's smile, and the words that I spoke would seem awkward and false. Or I would be helping Gramps dry the dishes after dinner, and Toot would come in to say she was going to sleep, and those same words, white folks, would flash in my head like a bright neon sign, and I would grow suddenly quiet, as if I had secrets to keep. Later, when I was alone, I would try to untangle these difficult thoughts. It was obvious that certain whites could be exempted from the general category of our distrust. Ray was always telling me how cool my grandparents were. The term white was simply a shorthand for him, I decided, a tag for what my mother would call a bigot. And although I recognized the risks in his terminology, how easy it was to fall into the same sloppy thinking that my basketball coach had displayed. There are white folks, and then there are ignorant motherfuckers like you, I'd finally told the coach before walking off the court that day. Ray assured me that we would never talk about whites, as whites, in front of whites, without knowing exactly what we were doing, without knowing that there might be a price to pay. But was that right? Was there still a price to pay? That was the complicated part, the thing that Ray and I could never seem to agree on. There were times when I would listen to him tell some blonde girl he'd just met about life on L.A.'s mean streets, or hear him explain the scars of racism to some eager young teacher, and I could swear that just beneath the sober expression Ray was winking at me, letting me in on the score. Our rage at the white world needed no object, he seemed to be telling me, no independent confirmation. It could be switched on and off at our pleasure. Sometimes, after one of his performances, I would question his judgment, if not his sincerity. We weren't living in the Jim Crow South, I would remind him. We weren't consigned to some heatless housing project in Harlem or the Bronx. We were in goddamn Hawaii. We said what we pleased, ate where we pleased, we sat in the front of the proverbial bus. None of our white friends, guys like 